And that sound means we are now live here for our daily halftime report. Uh, tackle trading. What day is it? 220, 2019. We've got Cody, we've got Tim, and a very special guest. I invited very last second, my yeah. old friend Pearl. Pearl, how are you? Hi, no kidding. <laughs> last second. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Hey, uh, you know, the thing about it is Matt's traveling today, and we wanted to have somebody else on, get another voice. And uh, I was chatting with you online this morning, so I'm thinking, why not bring one of, one of the other traders in here? Cody, bring your screen up. Let's rock and roll. Uh, today is kind of a boring day in the market. And it may not stay boring, you know, with the Fed minutes coming out here in about uh, an hour and a half, but it, it really is kind of a flat day, stock pickers day in the market. We've got a couple of things I want to do at the end of the show, including do a prep, a full prep on Activision, which is flashing bearish, and a full prep on Apple Computer, which is flashing bullish. Let's start with the S&P 500. Cody, give me a technical read here. Trend, pattern, support, resistance. All right. So looks very similar to yesterday. As you can see, we, we have a double doji, we have a little doji party going on. Uh, Mark and I were talking about how it's coming right up in the 2800 level. It's still doing that. It's sitting there. Now, news is blaming this on Fed minutes coming out, but I think this is really just slowing momentum into resistance. Uh, wait and see. I mean, it's been running for two months. <laughs> Pearl, what's your read on the market right now? Obviously, we've been in this V-shaped recovery for a couple of months. It's been going straight back up. We're approaching that 2,800 level. What, what are you seeing in the S&P? It's a boring day. Yeah. <laughs> Doji day, right? <laughs> it's nothing. You know, I learned through hard knocks that when there's a day like this, you, uh, you need to learn to not do much. And that's as hard as doing a lot, right? So it's both ways. This is not a day where you go out and charge the field. No. By the way, I'm looking at our uh, chat coming in here. Welcome out to our halftime crew. And by, one of your own halftime crew is here joining us today. Everybody give Pearl a big hello and say, hi, Pearl. Great to have you, Pearl. Say something to Pearl and let her know how much uh, we appreciate her popping in here. I agree. On a boring day, don't overtrade. You know, you don't overthink it. Don't get in there and try to do something the market is not giving you. There's five data points in every candlestick, the O, the H, the L, the C, and the R. The R today, Cody, in fact, uh, take your mouse right over the top of that candlestick and tell me what the R is on today's doji. You actually caught me right as I was tweeting out for people to join us. All oh, right, cool. today's R is 13.50. On an ATR, that's what ATR measures, by the way, is the average R. Uh, the ATR is measuring the last 14 Rs exponentially weighted to the front end of that. It's a 28 ATR in the S&P. And we're only half of that range right now, but we do have some key events that are coming out here in the next couple of hours, including the Fed minutes. Cody, what is your expectation for those Fed minutes? Only half of Boring. that range right now, but we do have some key events that are coming out here Wait. in the next couple of hours, including the Fed may minutes. Maybe Pearl. Pearl, Pearl. You've just gone inside the matrix. You're listening yeah, to did. yourself <laughs> on YouTube as we're watching YouTube. I've done that many times myself, my friend. Uh, mute the YouTube stream so you can see it as well. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, what I'm expecting for the Fed minutes today uh, to answer your first question is nothing. Really nothing. I mean, when they went dovish and they chose not to raise rates, I'm not expecting any revelations that's going to freak out, scare, change the sediment of the market by any means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know what to, to really read into this. You know, these Fed minutes, they're curated. They're carefully crafted. This is three weeks after the event. Remember, the event was three weeks ago on a Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern time as well. And every three weeks after every Fed meeting, they release these minutes and they're not market movers. I don't expect a lot either. Uh, let's keep breaking down the markets one step at a time. Obviously, with the S&P, one of the biggest components of the S&P is Apple Computer. Give me a chart on Apple real quick here. Large cap tech is right up Pearl's alley. She loves these large cap, cap tech stocks. She used to work for Amazon. Uh, I believe. Uh, and Apple is one that I like to set up here. It was on the option report over the weekend. We've got a pullback. We had a consolidation time compression. Coach Mark calls that a pinch, right? As it's time mm -hmm. compressing. And then here we are triggering today. Cody, uh, what's your read here on Apple? So it looked a little bit better about uh, an hour ago. Uh, mm -hmm. If I go down to say a 15 minute chart, I was seeing this and thinking, you know, all right, we're getting that trigger on Apple. So we might've, 
might have uh, gotten gotten into that trade just because we were looking for it to get right about there. So depending on where your trigger was, that was what was looking like. It was going to be a signal up to the upside, but looks like uh, it faked us out. It's coming back down right now. Mm -hmm. My thought is uh, wait and see now because of the way it did this right here. Hmm. That intraday pullback, I mean, it triggered, pulled back. Now, actually, if you get momentum. Yeah, this the end one of the day, candle, yeah. that could be really good. Yeah. I actually don't mind that. Uh, Pearl, are you, do you trade Apple, by the way? Yes. How do you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I currently have a trade on Apple as a vertical, a call vertical. So I am willing to wait because... I, I get, you know, it's zigzagging right now. I entered it a couple weeks ago. Um, I risked very, very little money. I actually have, I, I actually have two different types of call verticals on Apple. One of them was a modification from a, from a long call. And I was able to turn that long call into a no risk trade vertical. So I risking no money in the market. That's a Coach uh, Noah special right there. Yes, uh, I learned it from him. It was great. It was it was awesome. Opened my eyes to a whole new world. Well, you know, those adjustment type ideas, it's um, probably at least an intermediate idea or above, uh, but you can learn that. What Pearl's talking about is when you start a trade out with a long call, and then after, if it builds a profit on the long call, you can then sell another call to turn it into a vertical bull call spread. And somebody in the chat type in vertical bull call spread. It's a wonderful strategy. I love the mechanic. I love the technique. Fantastic idea on that. And by the way, this was on our option report from over the weekend, Cody. So now here we are we're looking at this candlestick, riding that moving average. Not a bad setup. We might come back to it here later in the show and do a prep on it. Garmin next, though, we got to keep looking through the markets. Biggest gainer on the S&P today is GRMN. And uh, gaps are a little bit intimidating, I think, for a lot of traders. If you look at this. Oh, my God. 16%. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I was thinking Garmin was gone to the wind with. I mean, all phones have maps now, but I guess they make watches and other things as well. Mm hmm. They do a lot of things, actually. I think they're a more um, relevant company that you might think. I remember Garmin used to be that. They would do the satellite uh, stuff, right? I mean, they would do yeah, like GPS the, the systems. directions. Yeah, the GPS, on, the mm -hmm. original ones that you have in your car before they're built in. But they've gone into all those watches and health apps. And I think there's a lot more to that company than you might think. Breaking out on earnings, real, real strength. Pearl, do you trade stuff like this when it has an earnings report that's up 16%? Or does that just hit your radar and then you'll put it on a watch list? I personally don't trade earnings. I just find it to be too sporadic. Mm -hmm. for me. So, um, I mean, the only earnings strategies I do are like really, really wide iron condors right before earnings. Uh, but I personally don't do it. I just find it way too sporadic. I like something much, much more predictable. Yeah. For a lot of traders, you know, it's not where their edge is in a market. Others, they have earning systems, you know, it, it really to each their own. One of the great things about the financial markets is the base principles are your foundation. Uh, and then the actual complexity or what you decide to do, like you did with the bull call on Apple, that's trader choice, right? And so you can build your system the way you do. Earnings gap out here, obviously, is going to catch my eye. 16% move. That's pretty, pretty strong. Uh, as I keep looking through the S&P here, Cody, uh, to round it out, Devon Energy, DVN. DVN. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we have there. Another gap. Looks like a gap up, intraday pullback. Now it's a long wicked doji you know what's interesting about your charts young man is i don't think you have the corporate events set up because i'm not seeing earnings oh there there it is it didn't come in yeah, right, away. right there there yeah. it is yeah gapped out on earnings showing me some strength i actually really like the intraday pullback on this here's an example where you can take the action in the market and if you're a day trader you can actually play off of that a little bit it rallied out now we've compressed back a trigger above 31 you only got about oh, that's three hours that left, is, but it's a pretty good setup. I like it. Yeah. Oh, my S&P here today. Host Hotels, CF Industries, Cadence Design all round out the top five. Give me a look at CVS Health Go. They are down here today, down seven and a half percent. 
I was reading about that uh, in the prep notes. What was it exactly that, that that had them down? Just I guess the disappointing guidance they had. They came out with a forecast saying that they have uh, more pain at their long-term care business. They basically lowered guidance. They came out and said that we're not going to make as much money this year as we might have thought, trying to warn their investors in advance here. Stock gaps down, but a gap into support, you know, on earnings, on lowered guidance. I like that support gap. It kind of reminds me of what Coca-Cola did last week. If you look at KO. My computer will type KO. Mm Mm-hmm. Coke got down on weakness and there was opportunities here at support probably to even sell like deep out of the money bull put spreads, take advantage of the volatility crush and whatnot here on CVS. That would be at least available and on the table for a trader who does trade that kind of mechanic because the volatility doesn't come out right away. We all know about the implied volatility cycle, you know, where into earnings it will build up and then after earnings it will fade off. So for a trader like Pearl, let's go back to the chart on CVS, Cody. For a trader like Pearl who doesn't want to play the gap on the earnings, a post earnings might be a different type of scenario. Pearl, do you ever come in post earnings and sell options? Yes, I love that. Because I think I can still catch the volatility crush. Yeah. I do that. Yeah, CVS here is kind of setting up for that. I'd probably run the numbers on a bull put or a naked put. You know, think about it on that price, $64. You do naked put, you better be willing to take delivery. Uh, Quite a few other companies grabbing my eye on the S&P as we round out. Southwest Airlines LUV down 5%. I saw a pretty bad report from the FAA. Did you see that one, Cody? That one I I, I saw briefly. I didn't read up on it. Take it. I know that they've been trying to uh, get flights actually out here my way, uh, and they had a, what their first approved flight uh, maiden voyage, I guess, to Hawaii for safety concerns. So I'm wondering, I mean, is it related to them trying to up their safety technology, or did they fail some inspections? I didn't d- uh, dig too deep in past the headline, but the headline I saw is that they weren't doing a very good job always measuring the weight on the flights and they weren't compliant with a lot of the regulations that they put on those airlines. That's not the headline. Oh, you want to see they're, not, they're not measuring the weight of the flight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I, I, I completely want to hear that before I get on an airplane. Yeah. It didn't give you a lot of confidence. Actually uh, my wife, she was getting on an airplane one time and they had to delay the flight because they put too much gas on the plane. And I didn't even know that was a thing that, <laughs> They had they had to basically bring out a, a special machine to pull the gas out of the plane. I, I don't know. Yeah. Big shout out to my man, Chris Couch. Downgrade from Goldman Sachs today as well. Good catch on that, Chris. Always good to see a great trader like you in our, in our show here today. Walmart did the same thing. I saw Walmart coming back as well. Give me a quick peek on Walmart. Oh, Walmart they- didn't just come back. It like filled in a day and i actually <laughs> fill the gap. like to fill okay i love the gap out i love the inverted head and shoulders i'm really impressed with this company and i expected that gap to backfill just like it did back in uh, july of last year you know huge gap out backfield eventually found some stability i'm not saying this thing's going to trend i have no idea with that but i was impressed by the earnings now it's coming back here a little bit cody what's your read on the old resistance new support here oh i like it just as well i'd I actually want to see one more day right down to the 98. If I can get something in 98, give me a doji, then I would be looking for a bullish trigger back into this. Because uh, at first, you see my alert that I have here right above 106. I was looking at a breakout to the upside of 106, and that would have been been a little bit longer term play because that's where the previous resistance was. But now getting that short term resistance, I can see this as – you know, a legging in type play where if I get a doji trigger in, I can play it up to 106, see if there's a break, might leg into it a second time and add to that bullish trade. Pearl, with your history and your background in retail and marketing and everything, what's your read on Walmart in terms of competition against Amazon? I've been impressed with what they're doing online. Uh, I, that brand had an image problem for a long time. I think they are making strides in a positive direction to change that. What's your overall uh, read of this company? I mean, they're really, they're both really big retailers. So some of the uh, categories that Walmart has an advantage in, particularly in furnitures, 
Um, and also I think um, something else. So, so Amazon isn't, because I used to work on Amazon catalog, I just, I know a lot about that beast. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, risk with the Amazon catalog being that they have a lot of tech debt, uh, meaning like decades of technology trade-off that they made in the catalog that made the catalog more and more risky and more and more not accommodative towards the description of the product. So Amazon actually has huge holes in their catalog where they simply cannot describe certain things. They are lacking image, lacking descriptions, even lacking uh, price point. So there are a lot of ways that I think Walmart does capture the, the things that Amazon aren't able to list very well from a technology perspective. So there, yeah, there's, I mean, even niche players, niche e-commerce players does a far better job at presenting their catalog and soliciting customers that are particular in that, in that niche and they're extremely profitable. So. You know, don't look at Amazon as as the you know as this great you know thing in all categories. They're not. They they have a lot of different holes in them. Mm -hmm. You know, moving on to the Dow Jones, Cody, go ahead and grab a couple minutes there. I know you got to step away for a minute. Let's talk about the Dow. Uh, obviously, Walmart's a Dow component. Amazon is a huge retailer. If you had to pick one or the other, Amazon's got the growth and also the tech component behind it, their storage, their AWS, the different things they do. They have a more dynamic future. There's no doubt about it. But from a pure retail standpoint, I think we forget how much money Walmart actually makes. They are huge in terms of revenue and actual their in-store location and their online models are improving. So it's an interesting, interesting deal, I believe. I'm looking across the Dow here and, and you know, one, one of the debates we've been having for a long time, Pearl, Matt, and myself, and Cody, and Mark, and a lot of the coaches internally is which one is stronger, small cap, large cap, S&P or the Dow. Out of the Dow components, I'm looking at some of the gains today. Caterpillar, you know, is up 2%. Dow DuPont's up 2%. What's your read on the blue chip mega companies here? I personally like industrial. I don't know. It just makes me feel safer in a more volatile environment from like a macro economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think we are hitting more and more volatility, either based on news or something that the market didn't really foresee. You know, we, we're going to have more of those incidents. So the industrial to me is almost like a little bit more of a stable, right? Mm -hmm. I am not the, I am not the kind of trader that swing, you know, the extreme on one end or the other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and it's well documented how, you know, much I've been bullish on Boeing and full disclosure, I do own some Boeing shares. So uh, the reality is it's been a juggernaut, even up 0.79% yes, today. I all on Boeing. Thanks to you, Tim. <laughs> Well, you know, here's the thing. When you look at what the world is doing and you look at the the, the storylines in the marketplace and the, the themes that end up developing in the marketplace, what you're trying to do with your money is get behind the most obvious themes. And with the resolution of some of the uh, tariff and Trump China trade negotiations and the U.S. having strength, industrials have been a juggernaut. And Boeing has been one of the better performers of the market year to date after it uh, really started down in around the 350 mark or so. I think we started 2019 in 320. We're up $100. <laughs> We're up $100 on Boeing in six weeks of market activity. Cody, uh, what's your read on this technically? If you were long, how would you uh, play this thing? Mute, young man. Oh, I am muted there. Well, since uh, we've we've been targeting the moon on Boeing, uh, I wouldn't do much of anything. But no, in all seriousness, I uh, I honestly keep just playing the breaks and the signals that this thing just keeps throwing at us. You can see that most recent break that it had. Mm -hmm. As far as targeting, I think the next target is probably going to be that 440 mark. And even then, I would probably take some profit, wait for the next uh, pullback or high base and leg in and add to that trade when when you have something like boeing that just keeps going in that bullish direction i'm not going to be legging out as fast as i'd actually be legging in mm -hmm. 
Another stock that's in the news in the industrials on the Dow Jones Industrial as well is Caterpillar. And Caterpillar actually, it looks like Boeing looked a month ago. You know, if you think about it, if strength in industrials is going to stay there, and if we are going to get resolution, this is the company kind of company that could benefit as well. We're post earnings in a developing trend. Uh, we're flirting with that 200 day moving average here. Pearl, on terms of moving averages, do you use them? And if so, which ones? Oh, absolutely. Um, I really like my 50 day moving average. So that's kind of the divide, divider between how I look at uh, something that's neutral versus bullish versus uh, bearish. So I use that a lot. Um, I, I also use the shorter term moving average 20 day, so 20 and 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that my brother, Mark, he, he loves the nine. So uh, he's been pushing that nine on everybody. I know, I went to his session. So. He was so into the nine. I, I don't fully get it, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're I, I will take his word for it. <laughs> well, and Cody, actually, you've become a convert as well to the nine. Uh, EMA, I have I right there. Yeah. I like it. When a veteran trader is passionate about something and really just, you know, believes in it, it doesn't matter if it's inside the current way that you analyze as a trader, you're going to be interested, you know, you're going to be like, okay, so why are they so focused on that particular indicator or technique or whatever it might be? Uh, I've loved moving averages forever. I think they're very simple and no pun intended now pun intended, but I did. And my training originally was the 200, the 50, the 20 and the 13. I've changed the 13 to the nine and I've adopted that as a more popular one. I'm going with Mark's lead here. What? I actually see wait, it. wait, wait, wait. When did you convert? Because <laughs> I remember you giving Mark a hard time. So when did you convert? First of all, it doesn't matter what the topic is. I reserve the right to give Mark a hard time whenever I want to. <laughs> <laughs> that is the nature of it. Uh, no, I listen, I've been using moving averages forever. It just is depends on the role. I call them secondary indicators. I think most of the market would. Let's move on to the NASDAQ. I don't want to get pulled into a mark fight when he's not here uh, to, to really run me down. And by the way, he enjoys that more than anything. Did you hear his drops on Twitter, Cody? I haven't heard them yet. But I, saw, I saw him popping up. Or I I heard something about yelling at Girl Scouts. <laughs> is oh that right? It, I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have not had as much fun uh, listening. <laughs> it was incredible. Uh, the NASDAQ is hitting the 200 MA here. It's got relative weakness against the other ones we just looked at. Uh, gainers today, you know, NetApp, Marriott, Analog Devices, Clack, Cadence. Some of the losers are the gaming stocks. And I want to look at them again here today, Cody. Oh. Take two is down and it was on our option report. EA is down 5%. Take two is just absolutely taking it on the chin. Pearl, do you trade the games at all? Uh, not very much. I guess do you play EA's video taking, games, so. Pearl? I don't really play games all that much. Although um, I am actually, I have, my best friend is really into games. So I'm starting to play some of the things that she wanted to like play with me. Yeah. Um, I do have AMD on. That's the closest I have with gaming. Yeah, because the chips and, and whatnot. Uh, those chip makers are also volatile. Let's, let's stay with the games for one second, though, Cody, before we go on to chips, because I do want to talk about AMD Absolutely. and the others. What's your read across this uh, space here? Take two, EA, Activision. They're getting slaughtered today. Uh, EA, even though it had, had its jump, uh, take two, I mean, had that gap down set up, gap down on earnings, and then we had another gap after that just based off of the, the news being released from that other game that hit the market. And, I mean, they're just struggling to keep players interested. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't sell the customer if people aren't getting interested in any of the new games. And I guess, I mean, there's only so many first-player shooter games you can make before people start thinking they're all the same. Yeah. I'm not a gamer, so I couldn't talk too much into that. Coach Mark, uh, or not Mark, uh, Coach Frank is is the the uh, the go-to gamer guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Frank, Mark, Matt, we have a lot of gamers in our company. What's really fascinating about the space is how volatile it is from day to day and from week to week. They are just flying. Uh, they are definitely trading instruments, and the options are great. Take two is on the option. Day. Oh my god! Not even a pullback. Just oh. it just jumped yeah. off the cliff. Yeah. 
took three steps, walked the plank and down. Boom. <laughs> I like it. If you don't have gaming stocks on your watch list, make note. There's no doubt about it. Let's go through the fangs. All There's right. no way Start in the world. Facebook. I'm, I'm going to have Pearl here and not talk about Amazon. <laughs> well, we gotta, if we're going to walk through the fangs, though, we're going to go in order. <laughs> All right. Uh, Facebook pullback here, Cody. I have a debate going with Matt this morning where, and he was getting ready to get on a plane, going out to Philadelphia uh, and whatnot. We're like, is this a buy yet? And I don't, we said, we'll said no. I think it's a little premature. No. It, yeah. It, my first is no backfilling and you also have a very aggressive short-term trend line on the intraday that's been keeping it down for me it's got to go above 164 50 or so that intraday resistance maybe even the 165 mark give me a read on facebook if you would uh i'm seeing that fade back still just like you were saying my my first instinct when i looked at this was i mean it, it gapped up uh on earnings above the 200 and it just it's fading down below it I'm not seeing anything that makes me excited to buy this right now. If we can get maybe some some strong volume and an up candle, mm -hmm. okay, then I'd start looking at it. But as of now, I can see this thing continuing to fade downward for another week. Nothing here says buy yet. It mm -hmm. says wait. That was my first thought when I look at this. Yeah. Uh, we've already looked at Apple. Give me Amazon next, if you will. All right. And I'll let... Uh, I'll, I'll pass this one off to the expert of Pearl. Pearl. I have I have no trades on Amazon. I have no position on Amazon, but I have an opinion about Amazon. I'm going to hold it till I hear yours. Yeah. So I think it's out of the vein. I think Amazon is probably the most stagnant out of mm -hmm. all the vein. So I, I think that's, that's kind of an indicator. I've been, I personally just been selling iron condors on Amazon and I've been doing pretty well, but I really have no directional bias. If you look at all the moving averages, the setup, I mean, it's, it's just a mess. It's just going to stay there. <laughs> yeah. What was your read when Jeff Bezos pulled out of uh, the Long Island location in New York city? Do you think that's good for Amazon? Is that just more of how he is running that company saying, Hey, we're going to get what we need. We're going to find a different location. What was your reaction to that story? It really didn't matter. I mean, regardless, they're going to have another headquarter. So it's either one government municipal that will give them a big favor or the other. So he yeah. didn't lose anything. You know, being up there in the Northwest and having worked with these teams and worked for this company in the past, Pearl, um, you know, I think it is the most stagnant of the fangs. And one of the questions I, I have, and I had it for my coaches last week, and we had a long debate about it. And I kept bringing it up and they kept shutting me down. I actually think if this thing breaks down, it has a potential for a sell off here. And uh, I'll tell you why relative weakness in the market, everything else is up. Everything else is performing amazing. And Amazon is stuck in, in, in neutral here. Yeah, uh, that's telling me something, Cody. If the market does want well, to pull back and it breaks support, that would be an ugly signal here. To that, to that point, now I, I want to ask you a question on this. So you see potential weakness in Amazon, whereas we were just saying that with Walmart, we like what they're doing and how they're actually trying to compete in that space. Do you see Walmart as a potential market share threat to Amazon? A hundred percent. I do personally for their online models, for their business models. Uh, go to the fundamentals tab here on the analyze tool. Absolutely. In Amazon. There's some interesting things you can look up. If you go all the way to the bottom in thinkorswim and yeah, this is fascinating. This little section right here will show you the breakdown of where and what kind of profit they make, right? In terms of their estimated revenues and earnings and whatnot, uh, you'll, if you keep coming down here, their web services, AWS, and Pearl explain these different things. So when they say Amazon web services, what does that entail? Um, this is one of the fastest growing segment in Amazon. So AWS is where they uh, host all of the uh, cloud computing mm -hmm. with both the small and the largest companies in the world. They are literally the uh, uh, business cloud computing giant. And not only that, there is back end where they can even service your cloud uh, computing logistics. They can service your uh, customer service center. So as a small business, you literally can outsource all of your customer service, logistics, uh, computing space through Amazon Web Services. It's a very powerful 
it's the fast growing segment, fastest growing segment at Amazon. Yeah. And you'll notice it's 42% of their net total estimated revenue, I believe is what this is measuring right here, Cody. And then you'll notice Amazon North America, which is everything else. That's the retail stuff, Pearl. Is that right? That's the Amazon North America. So it's not just retail. There's a gigantic um, logistic backend as well, right? And there's a logistic backend where we service uh, 3P sellers. So 3P sellers is the largest segment of sellers with Amazon retail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see, you'll see Amazon International is 17%, which is dependent on global growth and spending and all those kind of things. Pearl, this was a division that you particularly yes. were working in, right? <laughs> yes. It's chaos on steroids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, you know, it's just like the stock market, right? Whenever you're doing a... Uh, commerce internationally it's extremely volatile so we could we could be growing 300 percent a year and down like a hundred percent another year in some other markets so it's it's a very um you know it's chaotic by nature and uh, the international segment uh it's growing very very fast but it's also the smallest segment and has the most challenge in terms of moving uh logistics globally. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about where Amazon is, the original question is, is Walmart a competitor to Amazon? Well, not with their ent entire business. They obviously have the AWS stuff. They have their cloud computing. They have their growth internationally that may not have competition with Walmart, but still a very core part of their business, 40 to 50%, it seems, is still the retail side, you know, internationally and nationally. Uh, so obviously that part of it is competing with Walmart. And I like what some of the competitors are doing. Amazon's still leader. I literally purchased something on Amazon today, a cribbage board, because I'm going to see some of my Canadian friends and we're going to play cribbage in a couple of weeks. So I had it shipped to my house, 12 bucks, you know, Amazon is so, it's just so convenient. They're not going anywhere. And I'm impressed with their AWS stuff, but let's not forget, this is a growth company. It's a high PE company. It is not necessarily bringing in all the revenue to justify the current price it's based on future expectations. So if the market did turn, this one could be uh, on, on the hook here, in my opinion. But conversely, if it did break out as well and the market stayed bullish, this range here is developing into a classic K trade. And I loved what Coach Noah said in the chat earlier, maybe a back ratio spread, you know? Noah, that'd be a good one to talk about potentially in like a trader's lounge here in the next couple of days. Set up a back ratio spread which has potential one way or the other, but also natural and hedging risk control in that strategy. I think that could be a common sense idea. Uh, Netflix next, Cody, if we would. Uh, why does it not want to? Uh, Netflix, there we go. Mm -hmm. Ding, ding, ding. Netflix, I've been watching Netflix for a while. I've been watching this this longer cup and handle pattern it's, it has going and it's been fading right up until up to 360 it keeps trying to break and just it's flirting that's what it's doing it's flirting netflix it, you, you play basketball growing up Cody. <laughs> it's a good way to put it i did not <laughs> this is the old is classic head and ball fake it's been a fake out now for a week in a row. That 360 mark has tried to break and run and it fails candle by candle by candle. It will not carry through on this. I don't like that kind of characteristic. We're now developing into a wedge. Wedges can take out the top and run. They can also come back into a range. It's interesting volatility. We're faking out on these little price triggers here and not a lot of carry through yet. Uh, Pearl, uh, Netflix, I'm sure is on your watch list. Uh, what, what's your read here? Oh, I don't, I don't like it. I think it's just too much zigzagging for anything directional. Yeah. Um, but I have been doing bull puts. So that's what I do. <laughs> that's actually yeah. exactly, I have the same trade on this page. I have a bull put on Netflix because it was like, if it doesn't break, it'll go sideways. Still make money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And last but not least is Google. And Google has been a fascinating company to track. They've also been in a compression range. Give me a full read here, technically, Cody. Uh, I look at Google and think that it's 
it's messy. It's trying to figure out what it wants to do. I haven't seen much. I'm starting to see a little bit uh, where it's not sure if it wants to be above or below its its 200 day moving average. Google's mm-hmm. hard to really say because it just whereas other things are starting to you know they had a nice reversal that V shaped recovery. Google's just been choppy this entire time. Yes. Technically, it's just a messy chart, and there are better ones out there. Yeah, probably better for things like cash flow pearl. I know your your cash flow core, uh, but what are your favorite strategies that you do for cash flow? Um, iron condors, bull puts, bear calls. Um, yeah, those and and also broken wing stuff here mm-hmm. and there. If I have a little bit of directional bias, uh, yeah. Those are my cash flow things. Very, very cool. You know, it's really fascinating. Go to a heat map, Cody, if you would. Finviz or Tackle Trading, either one works for me. Or even here inside, uh, Thinkorswim would work too. Uh, It's really interesting. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. The leadership of the fangs is what ran the market for so many years, right? And now we're seeing, we just went through all the different fangs. And there's some setups I like. Potential on... Oh, there it is. Potential on like Facebook and those kind of things. But the fangs are not the leadership in the market right now. Amazon flat, Google failing to break out. Netflix was doing great, but now it's hitting its head. Facebook pulling back, Apple pulling back. And I love the setup. But guys, the leadership in the market has been in things like Boeing and industrials and energy and (laughs) and gold. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And we'll get into gold here in a minute. But what does that tell us here, guys, when tech leadership is slowing? That tells me that the the movement in tech was just that it was it was the the fast movers that uh, different traders and institutions were getting into for that rapid growth. That and now that we're starting to see a shift into more of the stable uh, companies or assets like gold, that tells me they're they're slowing down on what they're seeing in tech in that aspect. They're just they're becoming a little bit more cautious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Earl? Yeah, I concur. I think uh, those really high valuations, fast moving stocks and tech are finally sort of finding its stable reign while the rest are catching up to define this bull market. So that's the characteristics. Yeah. You know, there's some really amazing tools out there that you can compare all this stuff. And I know, Coda, you do the newsletter and we always break down sectors on the weekend and we talk yep. about rotation. Uh, tech, uh, there's some interesting companies in tech that I really like, but I'm also seeing some slowing momentum there. There might be a little bit of rotation developing here. Energy, industrials, and like Pearl mentioned a minute ago, gold are also running. Let's keep working through the markets mm-hmm. back on the chart. And let's move on to crude oil, if you would here, Cody. Crude light on Wednesdays is always going to be volatile. And we had moved this thing into bullish category. We talked about it. That breakout was significant. It is clearly running here. Uh, you know, long commodities has been a smart play for most of this year as we've seen the, the recovery developing. Cody, give me a read on the technicals. So we had that break and actually we had one back here that I had noted uh, two weeks ago. And then so we came down off of that. I actually start, I liked it better after it kind of bounced its head off of 55, came back down. Now we have a retracement which gave just a little bit more confidence in this break here. And now we're running up. Uh, I know this isn't used nearly as much as the 100-day moving average. is probably going to get right through that, in all honesty. Uh, this is a nice bullish retracement with the breakout through 55. I like this. Still looks bullish to me. The s- large head and shoulders that it had, I think, has confirmed the reversal, getting more bullish on crude every day. Mm-hmm. Pearl, long crude here has been a, a smart play. Is it something you've been watching? Oh, it's something I traded since the very first day of my my legacy education. Mm-hmm. So it's something I've held on for three plus years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually really, really good. Even, even when it came down, that entire um, downtrend, it didn't hurt me because I bought it way before, <laughs> way, way back. And you so, play the ETF, is that right, USO? I play the ETF, yes. Yeah. 
You know, one How thing. How far is, back do you buy? Oh, <laughs> way, way back. <laughs> Earl goes way back. She's yeah. old school, young man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just wait, Cody. When did you start trading? I started trading. Uh, well, with tackle about three years ago. Overall, about four years ago. Okay, so I think I probably just a little bit behind you. Like, I'm in my third year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I actually mentored Pearl a couple of years ago. We did our mentorship online and uh, while she was still working and busy and then, uh, you know, cash flow has been her core, uh, ETFs are a great way to play it. And we talk about this all the time, Pearl, you know, when we're doing our analysis, I like looking at the futures market. Even if you don't trade futures, I prefer futures because it's the core price and the more accurate 24 hour a day price. Crude light here is $57 a barrel. That's the one that you're going to hear quoted in the newspapers and on other shows and all that stuff. So even when you trade USO and Cody, when you get a second, bring up USO, I mean, the USO price is different, but it's tracking crude oil. And you'll notice that V-shaped recovery and breakout. It's now moving higher. Uh, Pearl, do you have any concern about those falling moving averages here? Um, yeah, I do. Um, but they don't really, I mean, I'm looking at USO for like a five, 10 year hold. <laughs> so I, I, at this point, I mean, my cover call has, I mean, replaced more than half of the principal. So for me to get out of USO, maybe like after, I mean, it's getting very cheap. So one of my concern is that the, the cash flow I'm selling on the call is very, it's not very profitable. So I have reduced the size. Of mm -hmm. my USO holding, but in general, yeah, if it breaks down below nine, I'll sell everything. Yeah. So you have a plan, you know where the low is. It now has a higher pivot high and a higher pivot low and a breakout. We've got concern up here. Now, by the way, a lot of times, and if you guys out there, if you're watching Halftime Crew, welcome. It's always great to have you guys. Uh, we've got a lot of people here, not enough likes though. We like that 50% Fibonacci retracement on the likes to attendees. So everybody give me a what quick thumbs right up now. Here. I think we're about 30%. Oh, that's not nearly deep enough of a pullback. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'll say this, if you've seen the tackle 25 course, you know that when something runs and it's a core holding, even if it's in a long-term hold pearl, those are opportunities to maybe cover, right? and pick up some cash flow and things like that. I really like the weaving in and out of call options through technical signals. So if you've watched the Tackle 25, remember, I think it's module number five is managing bullish conditions, right? When it does run like this, those are opportunities to cover that stock or that ETF and pick up a little cash flow as you're doing covered calls. You, you still do cover calls, Pearl? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's one of my best performing strategies ever. It's the definitely one of the best. <laughs> we have to talk gold. Oh my. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I we mean, do. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this and it is a classic example of position trading if done well. Gold is not a holding. Now you can do anything you want with your strategies, of course. I mean, that's where you as a trader have to figure out your exact mechanics that you're using, okay? Gold is a really fascinating one in the regard that when you do hold it, you're hedging other things. So it's a, in my opinion, it's a better position trade than it is a swing trade. But people could debate that, I'm sure. We've had four tremendous candles in a row, okay? The Federal Reserve has gone dovish and gold is now running. Uh, I know the dollar has pulled back into a location where it might pivot. Here's my question for the two of you. If you're long gold, do you take profit here or do you just move a stop loss? How do you handle this condition? Well, I'm going to give you the lawyer's answer and say it depends. So it depends on how I was playing gold. If I was straight long in futures market, I would probably trail. If I had some spreads against it or – maybe uh, some options against it, I would probably then spread them out. Mm -hmm. So if I had, let's say, a call option, uh, then I would sell a, a uh, another call against it just to get that spread, lock in, make it a zero risk trade. And if it continues up more, then you know, I'll take some more profit. So it depends. <laughs> but there's definitely something that needs to be done 
now? I use gold as a sort of an entire portfolio hedging. So I have a substantial percentage of my IRAs in, you know, in gold ETF. And I've been selling cover calls for multiple years. And what's really interesting uh, of my observation, particularly at the end of last year, when we had the whole bear movement was that gold did really well in terms of really hedging my entire portfolio value. So it just made so much sense for me to like keep on buying. So I currently have gold is running up. The next retracement, I'll probably buy again. The next retracement, I'll probably buy again. You know, I'm slowly kind of, I mean, my average, my average uh, price is very low on gold. So I, I have a lot of room and, mm -hmm. uh, and I rotate kind of taking profit here and there and then keep on buying. I want to ask everybody out there, if you're halftime crew, how do you play gold? Do you play the futures market? Do you play individual companies? Do you play ETFs? Uh, look at GLD real quick here, Cody. Obviously, a very popular ETF is going to be like the GLD, the Spider Gold Trust, you know, uh, or IAU, Cody. It's an iShares Gold Trust, also very liquid, 12 million or 12 billion assets under management. They actually trade more volume on IAU than GLD does now. Uh, but then you also have like the mini trust and you also have the long X uh, UGLD is a three X ETF. Okay. So there's different ways you can get exposure to gold. You'll notice here. I mean, this three X ETF here on UGLD, it's gone from a hundred to 108 in about four days or so. Right. It moves a little bit quicker. And I put one on Twitter the other day, Cody, that I thought was fascinating. And that is J N U G which is the N U G the miners three X ETF. So and I generally one. don't recommend leveraged ETFs to any trader who doesn't understand exactly the complexity here. These are more trading vehicles than say GLD GLD or directional gold is you can hold onto it because you don't have the time decay, but how does everybody out there play it? Are you using Earl likes the GDX, uh, Sess likes Nougat and UGT, which is also a very good one. Yeah, Cody, what's your preferred? Yeah, it's pretty good. My preferred, if I'm playing gold, is actually the futures uh, or just GLD. I've looked into a lot of these shares and trusts and leveraged. And I, when I first got started, I tried to do the leveraged. And it's just, whereas you can see the benefit, there's also more risk and management and things to worry about and mm -hmm. i'm i'm slowly evolving to the trader where i'm i'm sick and tired of worrying and i'm getting more to the point where i just want the simplicity behind it of if i can just have something that's going to move when i when it should move then that's what i'm gonna play <laughs> and yeah a lot of the leverage stuff just it, it, you also when in when when gld or when the futures are just going sideways those triple leveraged ones are typically losing value. Mm -hmm. And that I also didn't like. It's like, okay, this should just be holding steady, but it's not. It's losing value and it's losing at a pretty rapid rate because it's three times. So I stick to the simple ones. Listen, I, I think GLD is a great product. You know, if you want to get leverage behind a GLD, just play the options, right? But yep. the other 3X option, I mean, you can get into the other ones. Uh, I also like some of the stocks that track them. Uh, bring up, and we don't, we rarely look at HG in the halftime report, but give me the futures contract on copper. I'll give you one other potential idea here. Okay. Copper's breaking out, running. Go watch the commodity report from last week. We called it uh, to where it's bullish, right? We see the breakout. It's showing me tons of strength here. Fascinating product. Guess what stock is on the tackle 25, Cody? Freeport, MacMarin, copper and gold. FCX. Yep. So there are companies that are miners that have exposure to both, which you can obviously still participate in. Now, FCX here gapping out, showing strength, inverted head and shoulders reversal. That's copper and gold as well. There's so many ways to play this stuff, guys. Fascinating. You know, silver, 
is the competitor that a lot of people think against gold, but quite frankly, it's not necessarily competition. They run together. Uh, the SI contract, if you would here, metals and mining, they're just running. They're running hot. This is now a new breakout. Give me a technical read here, Code. Nightmare. What I'm saying is uh, the it's moving up towards the resistance level it has right there, about 1620. Mm -hmm. So even though it had this retracement down it, and it broke through 16, it needs to, I want to sit above 1620. Mm -hmm. And so many of these metals are, are up as the dollar is down and the Federal Reserve here has their announcement in about 35 minutes. So before we finish our show, we have to talk about currencies and this Fed minutes. Uh, dovish Fed response, dovish posture, it obviously means that we're going to see a dollar with some volatility. As their opinions and the news comes back and forth and whatever Jerome Powell says, we're going to start to read the tea leaves very, very specifically. Uh, chart on dollar sign DXY, if you would, Cody. And let's bring this one up. Pearl, do you trade currencies? DXY. I currently don't trade currencies. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all in due time. I look at it as my daily routine. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Even if you don't trade it, you sh everyone should be looking at it. Well, it's the biggest market in the world. You know, I mean, the, the U.S. dollar is the most important instrument for financial markets in the world. Uh, money in circulation, quantitative easing program that just absolutely propelled this market from 2009. Here we are now looking at a market where we thought the Fed was going to unwind that balance sheet and reduce some of the supply in circulation. They're not doing it. This whole dovish posture could, and it has had the market going back up in stocks and commodities, you know? And as I'm looking at this here, this dollar to me is neutral. Now I know that 96.5 is very, very important. If you break yep. below here, Cody, then we're just probably moving into a more neutral range. Back that out to a weekly chart though, if you would. That I can do. This, this thing, I mean, the dollar has been slowly working its way up, but it's really struggling right now around this range. And it just seems to base. And then it's like, okay, we'll go down. Oh, no, we're going to base again. Uh, did you see the, the Forex report I did over the weekend, Cody? I did. I really liked your Forex report. It was the, the over the go to bed trade. One of my favorite trades. Bank and open, bank open trade. Bank open um, trade. Excuse me. Pearl, have you seen it? Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> Pearl, as your mentor, I'm going to give you an assignment. You didn't think you were going to get a homework assignment today, but go watch that. I mean, if you ever want to learn how to trade currency, one of the most important things to learn is the the cycles, you know, between banks. And uh, Cody lives in Hawaii. You live on the West Coast. I live in on Mountain Time, but banks open when they open and you have different opportunities through the 24 hour a day cycle to trade that opening. And if you're out there and you're tackle trading Pro member, go check out that Forex report from last weekend. It'll teach you a little bit about that bank open trade and how you approach it. See, as currency markets are neutral, there's still opportunities to trade them. And one of the best things in currency is just learning how to play some of the basic pairs. The Aussie against the dollar in the afternoon or the dollar yen pair. Right now, we're seeing a lot of volatility and we're seeing neutrality. Until we break out, it might be a better day trading market, you know. Uh, the euro dollar is flat, hasn't broken down here on this weekly. We need some action. And until we get clarity from the Fed, we may not be getting it, right? Not only that, but also uh, we have Theresa May over with Brexit still on the struggle bus trying to figure that situation out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last few things as we kind of get towards the end of the show here. Give me a quick look at back at Apple Computer, Cody. That moving in our direction right now it's not necessarily that's triggering not apple. it's not apple. Uh, that's, that's not apple you're trying to spell it correctly the market did not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you nice catch pearl pivot it's trigger slowly. right there yeah. 172 yeah. five yeah you know it i asked to. i asked traders all the time what strategies they focus on and how they play it you know, one of the simplest things that you have to learn how to do is just button hook a simple buy and sell, you know, with a stop loss and a target. Uh, Cody, uh, set me up an order to buy and go long on Apple stock 
and let's kind of use a stop loss and target mechanic as well. All right. This was on our reports from the past weekend, by the way, guys. Actually, let me set this up because I'm pretty sure we're going to go to the risk graph afterwards. Let me just go ahead and go straight to the analyze tab mm -hmm. and do it that way. You got it, kid. Analyze a buy trade. And where do we think we're going to be setting up our stops and targets on this? Well, it's the fascinating question at all times is how do you update triggers, right? I mean, uh, when you were looking at it last week, you would have had a different location that you wanted to play something. Uh, for me here, I really think a conservative approach would be the high of the day. I know that we were breaking it down intraday. Uh, you could even make a debate that it's got to clear out the pivot at 176. Pearl, if you're yeah, looking yeah, at this for a new trigger, where would you personally need it to, to clear for you to confirm direction? Uh, let me go see the chart. So like, I think potentially, what is that? 30 minutes? Go back to the That day. was a 30 minute chart. I'll go to the daily for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's confirmed at the end of day to day, possibly. Yeah. You could, you could debate this. I think it's triggering now, and I think you could buy it at any point and set up a trade on it. What I always like to teach, though, especially for, for many different reasons, but I think it teaches the right mindset, is to find a trigger point on entry. And the high of the day would be another trigger. You know, There's no question. I'm looking at the candlestick here, Cody, and that H is going to be 173.32. Intraday, you could find a tighter trigger. You could even talk about doing that here above yeah. 172 and a half. Yeah, either one. Let's set it up on the high of the day, Cody. Be conservative right. here. Kind of set it up that way. And then stop loss for me, I guess it comes down to swinger position, but I'd be back below that 170 mark, probably 169. And from the option report last weekend where we always have all, and Mark did a great job uh, with that video I'm looking at our two targets, 180 or 185. So, and let's build them both, yeah. Trying to get these in here. Give me one second, guys. This is for our second target. Mm -hmm. And where do we decide on our stop loss? I think 169. I know from uh, last weekend, we talked about 168. So put it at 168. That was the number on the report. Let's use that, uh, that okay. trigger as stop. Mm -hmm. All right, 168. Here we are. Simple risk craft of just simply purchasing Apple. So this isn't doing anything fancy with call options or anything like that. This is just buying the, the, the shares outright. Now, Apple is a pretty expensive stock, so what we could also do is potentially look at the uh, call options on that. Do you want to go ahead and add that in, Tim, or we're kind of running over time already? Yeah, no, let's just do stock. Give me, a, give me the reward to risk numbers if we just went long stock here. So if we just went long right now, and this is 100 shares, so uh, our risk is $532 if we get stopped out of that trade. But our first target of 180 is 668. So that's about a one-to-one, -one, not quite what we really want on a trade. But, you know, we usually want two-to-one or three-to-one, preferably three-to-one. But mm -hmm. we at 185, we do get above a two-to-one risk-reward ratio, which is a good trade. Well, yeah, I, I actually think it's a really good setup. By the way, I have many traders who do equidistant stop and target. You don't have to have two to one to qualify a trade on your first target. Uh, the first target can be within that one to one, 1 1.5 to one. The two to one is really for second targeting and beyond. But I, I like the setup. I like the numbers. And really what you'd always want to do, and, and here's what I want you to write down in the chat, evaluate your reward to risk ratio, Okay. Uh, somebody in the chat put in reward to risk ratio. If you've been trading for a long time, you don't necessarily have to come to the risk graph to do this. Uh, but I know that the risk graph is very valuable for any trader. Once you start to understand how to use it, 
Pearl, do you remember your education in terms of when you started learning the risk graphs and how to map all this stuff out? Oh yeah. Oh yes. That was my first year. First year. Yeah. <laughs> One of the best things, like uh, there's not well, a single tree that I don't prep something out on the risk graph. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is that when I do call options nowadays, if I decide to entry, enter into a call, like just a long call, uh, I would look at, I mean, the chart is always number one and the risk graph to estimate ratio is, you know, the risk reward is number two. And then I use the, I literally have a flow where the risk graph can tell me like my maximum loss based on my rules, right? I don't lose more than 200 on those. So I would set that and go back to the chart and confirm like that that's actually a breaking support point or the good technical setup. And then sort of, I look at my budget, I look at, you know, the risk reward, I look at the, the, the graph, you know, the chart. And then I kind of come to an optimal idea of where I put the stop loss. I love it. I love it. Uh, guys, halftime report. We're done here today, but I got one question for Pearl before we wrap. Pearl, are you going to attend that women in trading event on Friday that Coach Emily is going to be hosting? Oh, wow. Yes, I am. Yeah. It's a pretty cool and really amazing concept. And I know, and I'm going to have to ask Coach Emily if the boys are allowed at all, because uh, I do want to pop in and say hi, but maybe not. I'm going to let her run the show. Uh, it's a really amazing thing to see other women empowering women and talking about markets and talking about trading. Pearl, I know you're also passionate about this type of idea as well. What advice would you give other women out there who are just starting into this field? I know it feels male dominated because it has been for most of its history, but what advice would you give the, the ladies out there? Uh, well, I would say that you know, don't get intimidated. It, it is a lot of new ideas and new things. Just don't get intimidated. Take it one day at a time. And also, I want to quote some statistics that women actually outperform in every asset management category. Just because we are more protective by nature and utilize that, right? Like being a woman is actually great in investing. I think a lot of them don't realize, statistically speaking, um, women are much, you know, just, just generalizing, women are actually better um, asset managers in every single category. And I think a lot of the financial industries are starting to realize that. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's the largest growing demographic of trader there is or are women who want to trade the markets, you know, and there's a lot of different reasons as to why I find it's awesome. I've had many students, obviously many men, many women across different ages, different categories. And I'm, I agree with what you just said by nature, rule development, rule followers, you know, um, all those kind of things. And yes, stereotypes can be accurate. Uh, I, was to, <laughs> I was trying to teach this to my daughter the other day. It's a strength, right? To strength to use who you are to reflect on your trading style and your portfolio. It, yeah. It's everyone has their strength. And I think women has one of the best strength um, out there. So you should use it. Cody, great job, kid. Uh, awesome job today. Everybody out there, if you're in the halftime crew, say great job, Pearl. Pearl, thanks for jumping in with us last minute yeah, here. Absolutely. You. Man, Pearl, right away, she was like, yeah, I'm ready to watch the show. Do you want to be on the show? Really? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. <laughs> I know her, uh, Cody. Sometimes you can call somebody up and you know exactly that they're ready to perform. And I know Pearl is a rock star. So great job, Pearl. It's always great to have uh, students come in here. And everybody out there, Friday night, we have a women in trading mastermind group. Tackletrading.com. Go check the event schedule. Tonight, though, before then, we have our cash flow condors mastermind group and coach Tyler. I think it's public knowledge by now, but he just had a brand new baby. So tonight when you see Coach Tyler, give him a big shout out and say congratulations to him as well. Uh, Halftime half crew, we are out. Great, thank you.